GP, um, Dr. Linda Bello. She's the chair of the Car um, Cameroon Doctors Association in the UK. And she's a GP who is in Colchester. So I'm going to hand over to her now and uh, looking forward to an interesting hour. Thank you, Dr. Bello. Uh, please uh, take over, thank you. Hi, um, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to come and speak to you today. Um, as you said, uh, my name is Dr. Linda Bello. I am the chairperson of uh, CAMDOC UK, which is an association of Cameroon doctors in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm also a GP. Um, I work in Colchester and London. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Lovely, so that's me. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking to you about is uh, setting some healthy living goals for this year, 2022. So what is good health? Um, according to the WHO, um, good health is uh, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So it's not just the absence of disease, so being unwell. And our body is constantly giving us clues about our health. All we have to do is just look out for them and then we can address what, is, what doesn't seem quite right. So what kind of signs can we see to tell us that we're healthy? So, or things that we do. So if we're eating a nutritious diet full of whole foods, if um, our skin is glowing, um, we've got hair that's not falling out so much. Um, if we go to the toilet regularly uh, and uh, if we exercise regularly, um, if our urine is clear, so uh, commonly called the sunshine color and not smelly. And if you sleep soundly, if you don't get ill constantly, and if you feel emotionally healthy and resilient. So, what is healthy living? Healthy living really is a way of living that lowers our risk of uh, being seriously uh, ill or dying early. Um, as we know, unfortunately, we can't prevent all diseases, but a large proportion of deaths, particularly those from heart disease or non-cancer can be avoided. And when we adopt this life, life um, healthy lifestyle we can get uh, we can give a more positive role model especially to people that uh, live with us if we have children or our extended family and we hope that our children can then uh, ex when they're adults extend this to their own children so when we're healthy and we have optimal health it's not only good for the way we feel it also um, affects how we can achieve our other goals so for instance, I'm, I'm quite lucky that um, touch wood and crossing everything, I'm usually quite well, uh, but over this Christmas, I was unwell for a grand total of two weeks, which I've never been before in my life. It was such a bad experience. Um, I found that I couldn't do all of the things that I normally did. And obviously um, during the Christmas period, you wanna cook, you wanna go out, you wanna uh, meet your family. And I suspect a lot of us now during the pandemic have probably been through a, a situation where we've, even though we've been quite healthy, we've had a situation where we've not been able to achieve stuff because we're feeling quite you know, unwell, you're feeling quite weak. So we wanna prevent ourselves from falling ill. So what better time to try and uh, maintain some good health and set ourselves some goals. So, I've got seven goals I would like to talk to you about today. Um, it might be like I'm teaching some of you to suck eggs and you've probably all heard most of these before, but I think it's really helpful to reiterate them again. So you're not gonna have any kind of goal setting without, you know, especially if you smoke, speaking about smoking, alcohol, exercise, eating healthily, talking about a healthy weight, rest and my personal favorite, uh, 
but having a positive uh, mindset. So I shall just take you through uh, these seven things. So um, smoking. Um, if you do smoke, uh, smoking really is the number one cause of preventable uh, uh, diseases uh, worldwide, uh, be preventable death worldwide due to a variety of diseases that it may cause. Um, it can cause cancer, most causes of cancer, lung problems, heart problems. Also, if you do smoke um, and you live, you have a family, you live with your extended family, you have children, um, if you smoke at home, which you really, most people don't now, you're not really supposed to be doing that. But even if you smoke outside and you come inside, you know, um, uh, there can just be some passive smoking and your family's risk of having um, a, a lung conditions or a cold or um, ear, nose and throat infections are increased uh, two to three times if you smoke. So the good news is that if you are smoking now, if you stop smoking before the middle age, you will avoid almost all of the increased risk that would have otherwise occurred. If you don't smoke, please don't think about starting. If you do smoke, you can lower your risk by stopping now. The health benefits you'll find will start immediately. Obviously, if you're smoking uh, more than 10 and you've been smoking for a long time, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to stop today. Um, you know, the reason people continue smoking is because it makes them feel good. It, it you know, makes them feel less stressed. And it's got nicotine in it, which you can get addicted to it. Um, so if you want to stop smoking, mostly you will need some help with that. The good news is that help is available free of charge on the NHS. You don't even need to see me uh, as a GP, um, although some of my colleagues um, will be providing that in their service, in their surgery, so a stopping smoking service. But if you just um, Google right now, for those of you who are already interested in doing that, smoking cessation service near me, you'll find that there are loads and loads of free services that you can call. And one of the best ways of stopping smoking is to replace the nicotine that's in, your, in the cigarette smoke, which is what you're going to be uh, used to and making you crave your cigarette. And that can be replaced uh, by, with a gum, with a patch, and there are also tablets. I'll just highlight you to my picture there. Uh, this is from one of the NHS campaigns about quitting smoking. And you can see that, that the lung on the left is supposed to be a depiction of what your lungs look like when you smoke. Um, and believe me, um, in medical school, when we had to do our dissections, we, did, we were shown um, lungs of uh, patients that had smoked and it was quite you know, the difference between a lung uh, of someone who has smoked and someone who hasn't smoked is quite apparent. So it looks quite dark. And you, and you would have seen it for those of you who smoke on the, on the boxes, uh, what your lungs and things look like. So um, I'm always saying to people, please, if there's one thing that you can do, if you do smoke, please, please try. So that's a good, uh, good goal for, for, for the year. Now, we can talk when we talk about smoking we automatically think about alcohol uh, a few a few patients tell me oh doctor i don't smoke uh, i only smoke socially that is when i'm drinking um, i might i might have one or two cigarettes as well um because we all know that when you drink a small amount of alcohol it can be a really uh, pleasurable social experience for for most however if you are drinking nearly every day, um, it's very important to know the alcohol limits. And the alcohol limits are they have increased recently, they have reduced recently. Um, so in the past it was 21 and 28 units for female and male respectively. And now it's um, 14 units um, on a regular basis. Um, so I would advise that if you're uh, drinking every day, if you like to have your drink, you should please spread your drinking over 
three Okay, uh, it appears that I was muted before. Um, so I was just saying that if you're smoking, if you're drinking every day, then you should uh, try and reduce that and have some days during the week where you're not drinking at all. Because as you will see in my next slide, that um, 14 units per week is really not that much if you're drinking two or three glasses of an alco alcoholic uh, beverage. So um, 14 units is equivalent to about six pints of average strength beer um, uh, or 10 small glasses of uh, a lower strength wine. So you can imagine that if you're someone who likes to drink a glass of wine with uh, your meal, two or three glasses, you can easily uh, uh, meet that limit in, in a five day period. So what most, of, most people decide to do is they say, oh, I won't drink during the week or if I drink during the week, I'll just drink on one day and then I'll have the rest at the weekend. But please, please, please don't drink all your 14 units on Saturday and Sunday or just on Saturday because that's binge drinking and that's equally worse. So if I just... Second. So... How many units are, are in a drink? So one unit is the equivalent of 10 mils of 100% pure alcohol. So if we had any drinks, I don't think there's any beverages that have 100% alcohol in them. I think I did see a 70% one this, this Christmas, which I obviously tried to stay well clear of. 100% um, of pure alcohol, uh, 10 mils of 100 pure alcohol. Uh, so 10 mils of that was one unit. And in one bottle of wine, uh, which is about 13% of alcohol, is uh, you'll have just under 10 units. So um, if you've already drunk two bottles of wine in a week, you've already far exceeded your 14 units. A large wine glass has got uh, 3.5 units, a smaller one, about 2.5 units. Those uh, small alco pops have got 1.5 units. Um, a pint of beer, two units. Again, so if you're having about three pints uh, in a in a day, then you just know that you can't. You can only have it on one other day, and maybe one more. Uh, the premium ones have more units, and then when we're talking about our uh, spirits, they usually have more percentage of alcohol, forty percent. So uh, be really careful with those ones. So the third one. Uh, I, I highlighted was um, exercise. So um, you won't have any kind of goal thing without uh, speaking about exercise. And I think most people, when they come and see us as a, their GPs, will be talk, asking them about exercise when we're talking about their general health. So in general, you would want to aim for about 30 to 60 minutes of physical activity on most days of the week. Um, but if you can get to about five days, of, do it five days a week, that's equally acceptable. Um, you want to try and have a strengthening exercise routine there about two times per week, if you're able to do that. So something that um, helps to tone your muscles. Um, and um, a lot of people uh, do some running. Um, I mean, I wasn't a keen runner before, but uh, my own way of getting exercise was to go to the gym, do a few classes three times a week. But um, during lockdown, um, I discovered running um, and I couldn't run at all. I mean, I tried the first day I tried, I ran about five minutes and I started to pant very heavily. Uh, I was quite disappointed because I actually thought I was quite fit. Obviously, I wasn't aerobically uh, fit. Um, um, but using this um, app on the couch to 5k, um, I was able, I can proudly say that I can run sort of 5 to 10k uh, 10K very easily now, but uh, in the last year or two. So uh, couch to 5k, I, I really recommend. Um, apologies for the noise. Um, I think my neighbor is having some uh, a shelf put up. So 
apologies for that. I've been told it will stop soon. Um, and um, if you can't run and um, you know, because basically you don't want to run on the road or you don't have a treadmill or you don't want to go to the gym, you could think about just walking. Um, so you want to aim for about 10,000 steps a day or more. 10,000 steps is about five miles. Um, and there's lots of um, apps and pedometers and things um, which you can um, you can try and uh, see whether you can achieve that. Now, for someone like me, I'm a, I, my job involves me sitting down most of the day, about 10 hours I could be sat down. Um, so you'd say, well, how am I going to get those steps in? It's, it's really difficult. So um, um, if you're in a position where you can park, where you have to park and you can park a bit uh, further away from work and walk to work, you might be able to do that. But one of the things that I, I've had to take to doing is um, walking. Uh, so during my lunch break, going for a, a brisk walk now, um, I'm, I don't manage to get a lunch break all the time. I, I do spend some of my lunch break mostly sitting down and trying to catch up on, on my work. Uh, but uh, I have made it uh, a, a priority uh, this year that um, regardless of how much work I have, even if it's 10 or 15 minutes, I'll just do a brief walk uh, around my car park or go up and down the stairs in, in the office. Um, I must admit, when I used to work in the hospital, um, this wasn't an issue because uh, there were lots of stairs and you were walking up and down, down the ward. So if you're someone like me who has to sit down just make it, a, make it a, a priority to kind of, you know, once an hour, stretch your legs. Some of us on our watches, it will tell you time to stand up when it tells you to stand up. Maybe walk around for a minute or two and see. Um, some of my colleagues have, um, uh, have invested in a, uh, in a walking, uh, in a standing desk uh, where instead of sitting down uh, the whole time, they're standing up. That really only works when we're doing our phone consultations, uh, because when I when we're seeing you in person, we have to be sitting down to your level. Now, you know, what of a form of exercise? Anything that puts up your heart rate, you should do. So, if you want to go to the gym, go to the gym. If you want to uh, uh, swim, uh, swim. If you want to do some dancing, dance. Whatever gets your heart rate up. You know, there's no hard and, uh, and, and set rule. Lots and lots of videos on, on YouTube. Don't even have to pay for anything. Do it in the comfort of your own home. But if you can do that for about 30 minutes uh, a day, that works really, really well. And you'll find that when you do exercise, your endorphins, you know, releases the happy hormones. You know, I find that if I'm able to get about 20 or 30 minutes of some running before work, that really uh, starts my day nicely and I feel really pumped to, to, to go. Um, so, um, healthy eating, yes. Um, you know, we can't have a talk about uh, being healthy without talking about food. You know, what we put in our body, the fuel, you know, so um, if we put good things, good healthy things, then our body works better. So that lovely picture there has nearly everything you need from a balanced diet about you, apart from your proteins, uh, your beans and your, your meat sources. Um, um, and, I, and I'd li just like to go through um, this very lovely diagram I found from the Eat Well website. Um, so just imagine that's your plate of food that you're going to have. And those are the, the rough proportion of uh, food groups that you should be having uh, to have a, a balanced diet. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, the bottom bit there, where you can see uh, for a female, um, a sort of average, uh, an adult, you would expect uh, to only need 2,000 to, to have a 2,000 calorie intake. You really don't need more than that, um, unless you're doing some form of uh, intense exercise where you might need to top up your calories. So we'll say about 2,000 calories uh, for, for a woman and 2,500 calories for a man. And that includes your food, uh, what you eat, and also what you drink. And I'll come to that in a minute. So ideally, if you want to have really good diet and, and eat healthily, then you should um, try where possible to make your own meals because 
then you know what you're putting in the food, you know how much salt you're putting, uh, how much oil you're putting. Now, not all of us are fortunate enough to be able to make our own meals or cook. You know, if you're older, you might be relying on some ready meals. If you're very busy, you might say, oh, I really don't have time to do that. That's fine. If you are going to buy something already made from the supermarket, please do look at the label on the packaged foods. So you want to be choosing foods that are low in fat, salt and sugars. And if you look and you can also see that it will tell you what the energy uh, content of the food is. So the calories. So you can easily uh, find out how much you're eating and just keeping an eye on it. I mean, I wouldn't encourage you to really calorie count and just take the life out of eating, but really just be aware of, of what you're eating, how many calories, because it can be, you can't really, you know, it, you can easily have three or four, three or 4,000 calories a day uh, without knowing it if, you, if you're just eating the wrong things. So you want to have a majority of your uh, intake to be uh, fruit and vegetables. Uh, you know, we all know about eating at least five portions of fruit and veg a day. That would be useful. That's really good. So pick any five you like on there. Then for your carbohydrates, you really want to avoid the, the white ones. So you want to try the whole grain ones, so the brown ones. So maybe swapping your white rice for brown rice, having high, you know, your white bread for um, brown bread, seeded bread, uh, you know, having porridge is always a good source of, 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 um, of those of carbohydrates. Um, and for your protein, um, that's where your fish and your meats come in, you know, try and avoid the red meat, you know, I wouldn't really be encouraging you to eat red meat every day, no, um, try and have more of your leaner meats, uh, because the red meats uh, do contain more of these saturated fats, which are the ones that are not good for you, Where, whereas your, um, your oily fishes um, and your chicken have more of the unsaturated um, fats, um, so you want to ideally be eating more beans, horses, uh, things like that, really eating more fish. Uh, um, and um, a, lot of, a lot of people, when they find that they want to lose weight, a lot of people try and adopt a plant-based diet. So you might say on two or three days of a week, I'll just have a plant-based diet. That, that works very well. There's lots of good alternatives, um, uh, plant-based alternatives. Uh, for your dairy and your alternatives, um, um, do try to avoid the really full fat ones, maybe go for semi-skimmed milk uh, uh, rather than the full fat milk uh, and choose things with lower fat and uh, lower sugar options. Now, one of the, the reasons why people gain weight or have more calories than they should in a day and then obviously gain, gain weight because you're having more calories than you need, that's why you put on weight, is because of the snacks, you know, very easy, especially for those of us, you know, at work, you know, you want to have a cup of tea, there's some biscuits, you take one or two, take three or four, and those biscuits are full of calories, you know, 50, 70 calories, before you know it, you've had 400 calories from the biscuit, you're not even very full from eating it, because they're not very filling, so really good to try and avoid the snacking, if you can, if you're feeling hungry, of course, you can have one biscuit or a few, few things, but you may want to consider snacking on other things that are help, uh, more healthy or zero calories. So snack on a carrot or a celery, that will work well. Now, all of this seems rather restrictive, um, and this is really just a guide, but my personal motto is that there is nothing that I don't eat. I just do everything in moderation. So personally, I have a Pancha, I love hot chocolate. Do I drink hot chocolate every day? No. Would I love to? I sure would with some um, whipped cream and, 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 and some chocolate sprinkles. Yummy. But I know how many calories are in that. So I'm not going to be drinking that every day. But if I feel like drinking it, I will. So everything in moderation. So you can pretty much, you know, eat what you like, but really put every, have try and have a balanced diet and um, you'll be able to, um, to maintain your weight. Now, 
an, an important bit about healthy eating is basically the fluids we put in. So it's very into our body. It's very important to stay hydrated. So good to drink at least six to eight uh, glasses of uh, fluid, ideally water, but your coffees and your teas do count, um, especially if you're putting a lower fat milk in it or even a, a nice alternative uh, plant-based milk like so soya milk or coconut milk, which virtually has no calories in it. If you're not putting any sugar in it, that's even better. And that would be really a, a good source. Now, you should really try to limit the fruit juices that you drink so to, about, to, to about 150 mils a day, and also to be limiting the amount of fluid that you're taking in as, as alcohol. And I will show, because actually, there are a lot of calories in liquids, as you can see in my next slide, uh, which is just here. So um, uh, just a small 200 mil glass of orange juice there already has 110 calories. That's fine to have one or two a day. But imagine you love one of those Starbucks, uh, all these, I, I mean, you can tell I don't really go to most of these coffee shops. I can't even remember some of the names. Nero, I think is one of them. Other coffee shops are available. Um, you go and get one of those medium ones. There's already 400 calories in that. So imagine you have two of those. You've already had 800 calories of your 2000 calories if you're a woman. So really um, important that you know what's in these liquids. Um, beer, as you can see, has 150 calories. Um, uh, a glass of wine, as you can see there, has 120 uh, calories. Uh, vodka, only 55, but obviously, <laughs> depending on uh, how many shots you're having. So um, uh, in general, um, if you try and just limit the amount of fruit juices you have, I mean, you can have it, you know, one or two, that's fine. Don't have it every day. Um, and really kind of limit the fluids to uh, water. Water is very good for you, hydrates you the, uh, uh, the, the most. Right, so if you're able to um, achieve a healthy diet, like we've just spoken about in the last slide, then hopefully um, if you've lost weight because of that healthy diet, you can maintain it um, or you can also achieve it uh, by eating well. Now. How do we know what a healthy weight is? We know this by measuring something called the BMI. This is your body mass index. We, um, we uh, measure that by getting your weight in kilograms and divide it by your height in meters squared and we get your BMI. You can do this yourself online by lots of apps and you can get your BMI. As a general rule, Anything less than 25 is ideal, and a BMI of above 30 uh, indicates obesity and, of course, a higher risk of um, health uh, conditions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, have reported, tell us that a healthy BMI really is between 18.5 and 24.9. So if you look at my little diagrams there of the female body, you can see the green one, which says normal, um, is between 18.5 and 24.9. Um, if you're less than that, that's underweight and can be associated with its own health conditions. So you really want to be in the green bit. Now, a lot of, 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 of patients I see um, are overweight um, and they don't even realize it. And, and a lot of us might have become overweight over the Christmas because we've been indulging and, and that's okay. So long as we are aware of it and we try and take steps towards coming down towards uh, the normal weight. When you get to 30, you're obese, and above 35 is extremely obese. At 30, if you haven't already sought help to help with your weight, uh, please do contact your GP or other healthcare professional and for help to lose weight. There's lots of options available on the NHS free of charge. In certain cases, you can even refer yourself to these, uh, uh, to these weight managers, management services without seeing your GP. If you did come and see me and your BMI was uh, in the 30 range 
or even it was in the overweight range, but you had you had diabetes or arthritis of the knees, and um, I would be in a position to offer you. Sometimes we have one tablet that we can use um, to help with the weight loss, and, and of course I would be trying to refer you as well. So help is available, uh, but the first thing is to try and actually find out where yourself. Don't be scared. I know for some people it can be triggering. So if you feel that you don't want to do that by yourself, obviously come and see us, come and see your nurse and we can, we can, um, we can check that for you and help you. But you need to, if you don't know, then you can't do anything about it. Um, another thing that we do try and, and measure these days is the, your, your waist circumference or, or your waist girth. So for a man, it should, the ideal, it should be less than 37 inches. And for a woman, less than 32 inches. Because we know that at a, at a waist girth of 40 plus for a man or 35 plus for a woman, that uh, it's associated with um, increased health issues. There is a particular syndrome called the metabolic syndrome, which uh, basically increases your risk of uh, having um, diabetes, and, and heart conditions. So really important to also know what uh, the, the, the circumference or your waist get girth is. So rest, um, very, very, very important in this fast paced world that we live in, uh, where we never think that we have enough time in the day. I mean, I'm one of those, I think, oh God, I wish that, there were 28 hours in a day because you always have something to do. But the, 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 the simple fact is that in order to be able to use the time that we have efficiently, we have to rest. Our bodies are not machines. We have to rest. Ideally, we need about seven to nine hours of sleep each night. If you can get seven or eight, that's wonderful. This is a basic, basic need that really impacts all other areas of our lives. Now, how do you know that you're already sleeping well? You'll know this. If you go to bed and within 30 minutes you've fallen asleep, great. If you sleep through the night without waking up more than once, that's wonderful. Again, you're sleeping well. You can wake up, but obviously if you fall back asleep in under 20 minutes, that's again, very good. Importantly, if you feel rested, and restored and energized when you wake up in the morning, you've obviously had a good sleep. So if you're not sleeping well, or you think, oh God, I'm struggling with the sleep, what kind of things do you need to do? The first thing is to prioritize your sleep. Now, most of my friends and my close, you know, most of my close friends know that I love sleep. And they know that if you call me, after 10 or 11, I'm just not even going to pick up the phone unless there's an emergency or my house is burning down. I'm literally not going to get up because I, I, I really got my sleep pattern that I have to sleep and wake up at a certain time. If not, my whole day the next day is not going to be good. Um, so try and make sure that your, you know, your bedroom is nice and dark. Uh, I put my hands up sometimes. Uh, I've uh, gone, gone, to, gone, to, gone to bed and left my side lamp on and woken up with it at night and that has just interrupted my sleep. So keep, keep it dark, keep it quiet. Uh, don't want it to be too warm. Try not to use your phone before you go to bed. Give yourself at least 30 minutes of uh, screen-free uh, time before going to bed. And um, if you're going to be drinking alcohol, if that's your day to drink alcohol, try to drink it. Uh, within three hours of bedtime. Um, and if you if you love your coffee and your caffeine, obviously, please try not to drink it sort of five hours before you're uh, going to sleep because that might keep you up at night. Um, so that's, and, and there's lots of um, uh, apps uh, available online to help you to sleep, Sleepio. Uh, there's a sleepcouncil.org website. There's an app for everything these days. Um, so if you're still struggling with the sleep, um, obviously you can come and speak to your GP or the healthcare professional and we'll be able to advise you on that because obviously there, there are some patients that have a, a sleep condition. Uh, unfortunately, some of my patients have to wake up at night because of bladder conditions. Again, that disrupts their sleep and I have to help them in other ways. Um, 
rest is not only about physical rest, it's also about taking time to relax and do things that you enjoy, whether it's uh, uh, watching TV, reading a book, going for a, a walk, anything that keeps your mind uh, at rest. So some people do like to meditate, do mindfulness, do yoga, whatever thing just that keeps your mind uh, and uh, rested. So when I did this talk, I um, I got to this bit of the slide and I thought, yeah, that's all I need to talk about with regards to rest. That's what all rest is. But uh, as I was doing some research, I found this lovely little uh, uh, picture here from uh, uh, ideas.ted.com about the seven types of rest. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is something that I should share. So I've already spoken about uh, physical rest, uh, which involves sort of sleeping, napping. Um, and we've touched upon mental rest, so things that, are, that help to calm your mind, slow you down. Um, there are lots of apps, even one minute, five minute meditations or mindfulness, things that you can do during the day to really uh, set, you, set you for the rest of the day. But there's also sensory rest, which is obviously um, uh, getting rest from all the noise and the bright lights and the screen. Some of us are looking at screens 12 to 14 hours a day. So having some time to switch off from that is, is very useful. Creative rest, you know, um, I have a very good friend. She loves, loves, loves to walk. When she's feeling a bit stressed, she just says, uh, Madame, I'm going for a walk now. And she goes for her walk <laughs> and she comes back and she feels rested. So I guess that's her own type of uh, uh, creative rest, um, emotional rest, uh, but feeling confident and comfortable to express ourselves freely. So you can get emotional rest, I suppose, by speaking to your loved ones. Uh, um, and I guess there are certain people that when we call and we've been having a bad day, you know, they can really they can really lift you up. And I guess it's a because you're you're resting emotionally. Spiritual rest for those for those of us that are spiritual and and you know go to church or have our, our certain religions that we follow. That deeper connecting to something deeper can be also quite restful. So engaging in things that make you feel restful spiritually if that is a, if that's applicable to you. And social rest, I guess, connects to the emotional rest is where you're kind of building all these positive relationships with others and also focusing on engaging with people that are actually lifting you up. So people that are giving you a positive engagement. So not going on, on any of those social media websites and looking at things that are gonna bring you down, but engaging with the things uh, that are, are, are lifting you up. So if you're going on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and you see something that makes you, um, um, upset take a rest from it take a two day rest from it don't even go on it if it, you know if that makes you feel bad so um yeah so I thought that was quite useful so seven types of rest and I I think uh, there's a few there that I'm gonna kind of try and put in some of my goals for the year to try and make sure that I'm actively doing those uh positive mindset um I had to end on this, this is this one more slide, um, positive mindset. I generally, if you ask people that know me, I'm an inter internal optimist. Uh, so uh, I think I, if you know, mostly when I wake up and I say, I'm gonna have a good day, I usually have a good day, regardless of what things are thrown at me because your mindset is already saying things are going to be good. And that in a way already, kind of lifts you up. So your mental health and how you feel about yourself has a big part to play on your overall health. We're continually being faced with challenges and setbacks in life. These are all inevitable. But if you do have a positive attitude, it does keep you motivated to deal with those and to stick with all of your other health goals. We've all had a very stressful last two years with the onset of the pandemic. I've had patients that have been previously happy and well and not never had any kind of 
depression or anxiety suddenly become quite low in mood, anxious. It's not surprising because we've all been going through difficult times with this pandemic. Some of us have become unwell, that we're never unwell because we got uh, COVID. Some of us have, have developed long COVID so, uh, and are continually fatigued. That can be quite draining and mentally challenging because if you're feeling unwell, you're, 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 no, you're naturally going to feel a little bit low. So if we, there are, we do have help available if you're feeling low, anxious, stressed, these are all available under, under the NHS. You know, you can come and speak to your GP. A lot of times you don't even need to speak to us. All of these are available on a self-referral basis. You can self-refer yourself to any local, local talking therapy. So if you Google self-referral uh, 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 talking therapy near me or in whatever borough you are, whatever city you are, it will come up. Nearly all of them do not require you to speak to your GP. If you don't feel like you want to talk, do it yourself, you can speak to your GP. We will happily refer you. We will happily speak to you. There's lots that we can do to help you manage your stress. You're not alone. Most of my patients that come and see me feel that they're the only ones that are feeling like that, feel that there must be something wrong with them for them to not be able to cope. The truth is we will all have a time in our life where we're not gonna be able to cope with things. The key is knowing how to, what to do during that time, who to contact, what resources uh, to use. So as I said, lots of things available, mindfulness apps, you know, gratitude diaries. Exercise is really, really important. You know, when you go and exercise, you walk out, you do release endorphins, serotonin, your happy hormone. These are, this is what we try and replicate with some of the medication we give our patients for you know, the antidepressants. Doing whatever lifts your spirits, singing, dancing. I mean, my personal favorites are singing and dancing. I find that it's very, very, you can, I can easily change my mood by listening to one of my favorite songs. And I do try to start my day by listening to a, a song or doing a little dance. Always, always gets me through the day. So I started this slide by saying that I have a very positive mindset. Um, I think I'm an, an, I'm an optimist. I think I'm a glass half full type of person. And then I was doing some research about positivity, glass half full. And I found this lovely picture, which says, it doesn't matter if your glass is half full or empty. The point is that your glass can be filled up again. Because, yes, I am an optimist, eternal optimist. I, I Mostly you'll see me, I'll be smiling, I'll be happy. But there will be days where I'm not myself. And on those days, I guess I have to try and fill my glass up with all the other things we've just discussed, with the things that make me happy, with my with the people that give me social rest and emotional rest. So I, I thought this picture was quite uh, candid. I could not end this talk. I know I said I was gonna have seven goals without talking to you about the NHS Health Check. Now, for those of you on the call that are age 40 to 74, what I will say is if you've not had your health check at all, you should have had one. It is a health checkup for adults in England aged between 40 to 74. It is designed to spot early signs of stroke, kidney disease, heart disease, type 2 diabetes and dementia. As I said, you should have received a letter from us, GP surgery, or your council inviting you for that. If you haven't received it, please contact us. When you come to the appointment, you'll be seen by a nurse or a healthcare assistant. They will ask you, have any close relative, have any of the illnesses been checked for? I've just mentioned them. If you smoke, how much alcohol you drink, how much exercise you, you, you do, you can see all linking to good health is about promoting good health. 
it will check your weight and your height. And we know why we're going to do that, to calculate your dead body mass index. You will also weight, measure your weight to check your waist girth. We would already have your age and your gender. We would be documenting your ethnicity. Why? We know that certain conditions are more uh, prevalent in um, Afro-Caribbeans. I think probably most of us on this call are Afro-Caribbeans. So we know that we have a higher risk of diabetes, high blood pressure. We tend to get this at a younger age. So I'll even say to any of my the younger the people below 40, if you're 30, I'd say probably we should be having our NHS health check from 35 if you're black uh, or brown. Um, so especially if there is a a family history of blood pressure and, and diabetes. If you've not had your blood pressure checked or your diabetes or your sugar levels checked, please make sure you get that done. We will also check your blood pressure and your heart rate. Again, please, 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 if you're going to take home one thing from this talk today, if you don't have a blood pressure machine, please buy one. Know what your blood pressure is. Um, uh, if you have any uh, worries about what a normal blood pressure is just take 120 over 80 that's the normal one but you know um, uh, you can speak to your gp about any fine any readings that you find are abnormal most of the machines will tell you if it's high or low we will be doing a blood test to check your cholesterol and sugar levels last slide look at the brown bits don't look at the blue bits there just a little summary of what i've just been talking about with the nhs health check that we're checking your BMI, your age, your ethnicity, blood pressure, alcohol, smoking, physical activity, family history, cholesterol uh, level. If we do find out that you're smoking, we will be uh, signposting you to a smoking cessation service if you so wish to engage with them. If we already find out that you're drinking too heavily, we will be telling you already and signposting you to where to refer, uh, to where to go to, and probably doing some extra tests because as we all know, alcohol can affect your liver. We may even be able to signpost you to exercise, uh, an exercise referral to a local gym if you fit the criteria for it. So certain condition for your mental health, arthritis, we can do a free referral to uh, participating gyms um, um, if um, you, you can't afford to go to a gym or even if you can, um, obviously using the, um, uh, the, the schemes that are already available. If we find out that your BMI is very high there, we can already start to help with the weight management, either by referring you already there or starting you on medication. And um, if we've checked your sugar and you don't have diabetes, yay, but you are falling the group of the, uh, the pre-diabetes, so at risk of diabetes, which is a new kind of category that we've put in the in recent years to prevent you from having diabetes, then we'll already be referring you onwards to a pre-diabetes service, again, which is free, which will be talking to you about diet um, and exercise. As you can tell, um, I'm very passionate about all of this. My work as a GP is to ensure good health for health prevention. So I was, I was really glad when I was um, asked to speak to you today. I think I've overrun by at least 10 minutes, but uh, I hope that um, you found that very useful and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. That was a, a lovely run through. And I think a really great way to start the year, isn't it? Because um, whilst I, I've stopped making new resolutions, but it's a chance to just stop and pause and think about how you can make your life a bit better. And I like the, I like the fact about the positive affirmation. I thought that was great, a great way to get into the new year. Um, so thank you so much, Linda, for that. It was a nice run through and there are quite a number of questions. So I'm going to start, start with them. Um, Count team, can you split our screen to have Linda on screen as well so that she can participate in answering some of these questions because we're here for her expertise. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Karine, for putting in the chat about the drinks. 
even I'm a doctor, but I find it quite confusing about them trying to remember the units. I wish sometimes the bottles would actually put on the bottles of alcohol, how many units, um, how many mils equate to, because it would make it much easier for us to understand. But that was great, Kareen, thank you for that. And um, I love what you talked about, about exercise. It's really difficult sometimes. I think we have to try and find ways to improve that. And I like the thing you said about parking a bit further distance. Absolutely fab. And age is not a limiter. I'll just give a shout out at the moment to my mum. My mum's 80. She looks at our health hour every week. I, I think she must be here somewhere. Hi, mum. And she walks and she's got an app now and she's got her little Fitbit and she walks every day and, and she's 80. So um, if she can do it, all of you can. So when it comes to the questions, there's a question here about smoking. And um, one of the questions that, they, that, that has been asked is about, um, is weed worse than cigarettes? <laughs> Anonymous question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, 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 I'd, I'd like to say that it probably, I'd probably say that it is just because of they're equally as bad as each other, but obviously we know that weed has been associated, can be associated with some um, uh, mental illness. Um, so um, of course we know it's very relaxing uh, for those of my patients that I've said, take it. Um, um, so obviously my PC answer would be definitely please avoid all kinds of smoking, whatever kind of um, ingredient you're smoking. Um, and if you, you do have to, just try and limit it um, as much as possible. Um, the other thing you talked about that is really important, I think people might be worried about, is the health check. Now, we have heard in the last two years about the incredible um, pressure that GP surgeries are under. And there almost seems to be um, a, a message that don't go to your GP unless it's, it's, it's really necessary. So I think people have put off going to their GPs to get their health checks. So it might be nice for some reassurance from you um, about trying to book a health check, because even when you try and book for something that you might consider is important, um, it's really difficult to get through. I, I know this because I've tried. Um, so you've got to ring within a certain time and you only get an appointment if it's class as urgent. So it's just um, some advice from the horse's mouth as it is about getting your health checks, because I think it's a really important bit of just ongoing health care. And, and that's really important at a time like this. OK, so I have to start by saying that um, not all GP surgeries are the way you've just described. For example, in my surgery where I work, we have something called open access, where if you come into our surgery, between eight and 10, you will get an appointment on the day. You just have to sit and wait. We also have pre-bookable appointments uh, uh, and we have a very, very good sort of feedback from our patients. Um, for the last kind of six months or so, so from last September at my surgery, we, we restarted our open access and we went back to normal. You know, a lot of, I took a personal offense. I know it wasn't personally me when, we had the thing saying, oh, GPs don't want to see patients. Oh, we, we've been sitting around doing nothing. I personally never worked so hard as much as I did uh, during the pandemic. Our workload has in increased. We want to see you. Um, of course, certain surgeries might be, it might be really difficult with the phones um, uh, going. We have had unprecedented demand and we are finding that a lot, that we have a lot more worried well Obviously, you were in the middle of a pandemic, so people that will not usually fall ill are falling ill. But we are still doing, and we're still doing the, the health checks. Yes, there was a, a time about three months ago or, or where um, we had to temporarily stop doing non-urgent blood tests. That was because of, of a national blood uh, um, blood, uh, blood, the blood bottles were, were, were in short supply, so we're only doing urgent ones. But we've started, most of most GP surgeries have started doing that. And, you know, our job 
as GPs is not to see you acutely. That's a and job. Of course, we see you acutely. We, we, we treat chest infections. But my main job as a GP is to manage chronic conditions and also prevent people from getting you know, spotting hypertension, spotting uh, uh, diabetes and things like that. So I would say that if you're 35, 36, above 40, you've not had your NHS health check. You have a, you have a family history of diabetes. But even if you don't have it, it's important to know because the amount of patients that we've picked up diabetes, they had no symptoms. They had not a clue at all. And we do know that diabetes can cause long-term complications. So we're not gonna be telling you off for coming to have your health check that is overdue, not at all, not at all. I would say, please, please, please don't give up if your surgery is really struggling with the phone lines. Not all surgeries are like that. You know, I have many colleagues that are GPs. Some are, you know, some have better access than others. Um, it also depends on, on staffing. You may have seen in the news that, you know, I mean, last year, think about we lost 300 of almost 350 GPs. Um, we don't have enough GPs. And sometimes your surgery might be struggling just because of, of uh, a staff shortage. But that shouldn't stop you from sort of trying, even if your, um, your appointment is booked for two or three weeks. Book it. You know, it doesn't always have to be on the day. Obviously, if you have an acute problem, you're unwell come to your surgery. If your surgery is not open, if you, if you can't get an appointment in surgery, you call 111. Obviously, we want to leave a &E and urgent care for the really urgent things. But if you're unwell and you can't go in, then obviously you might have to use those. But my colleagues and I, you know, have been working harder than ever. But we still, regardless of that, we will encourage you, NHS Health Check, please. And that's why I had to put it in the talk, even if it wasn't a goal, because this is really important. The number of people that haven't had this done and are not aware that it's something. Some of them have had it done age 40, 41, have forgotten that they should have had it done at 45 or 46, haven't come back to do it. So please, please, please. None, I don't think any of my colleagues are going to be sending you away if you come in with a genuine herd concern. That is our job. If we're not doing that and checking it, then, you know, when, you know, what are that's, we that's fine, Linda. I think that the, what I was trying to, to say is that there's mm -hmm. been a subtle message. I, I, I also took exception when they said that GPs were working hard enough. I've got lots of friends who are GPs and I know you've been working harder than ever. But the subtle message out there is that mm -hmm. they are overwhelmed. So don't go to them with, you know, unnecessary problems. Now, the health checks, are you, are, you set, are you sent a letter about your health checks so that you come in for it? Or is it something that you, the illness is on you to go and book? Yeah, usually you'll be sent a, a letter, especially at 40, you'll be sent a letter. It does uh, come usually from your surgery, but also from the, from the council. Um, I think also in certain surgeries, we send you a reminder. Sometimes when I'm seeing a patient, There'll be a pop up on my screen saying this patient hasn't had their health check. I'll, I'll take the opportunity to to remind them. But we do send out letters. Um, That's good yeah. to know. So if you're watching here and you haven't had that letter or you think it's a, a mail shot that's come through because we get lots of rubbish through the, the mail, please book your health check. So we like to have a take home message. So this will be one. There'll be lots today, but this is one of them. Book your health check. Now, um, the, the other question I've, I've had is about blood pressure, and that's going to be another take home message, I think, mm -hmm. about getting a BP machine. Yeah. And we've had lots of cardiologists on our calls over the last few years, and each of them have said the importance of buying a BP machine. And I must say, as, as a doctor, um, you might find it strange that I'm a pediatrician. So I didn't buy a BP machine until I was on one of these um, health talks. And when the cardiologist said, get a blood pressure machine, I got one and I now regularly measure my blood pressure at home. So um, even for doctors who are not in that field, who perhaps are not as a, as a GP, we, I didn't know not to measure my blood pressure on a regular basis because I, I class myself as healthy, but it's important to get one. So there's a question here about, um, you referred to the numbers. I think you said 120 over, over 80. So for somebody here listening to this who goes and gets 
a blood pressure machine at Boots today or wherever, from wherever, or from Amazon. Um, is there anything, does that number vary with age? Um, is there any way you can look up guidance so that they're not, we're not having the worried well in your surgery? Yes, yes. So most of these machines do come with some kind of a, a, a guide on there for you. Um, and what is important, 100, 120 over 80 is just an average that we say is normal. Everyone will have a blood pressure that is normal for them. That's the most important thing. So um, 110 over 70 is perfectly normal. So for the top value, I would we would normally say anything between 100, the top one, to 135, um, and the bottom one, uh, 65 to 85. Again, these are easily thing, things that you can easily Google up. Uh, and you'll see normal blood pressure readings, and a lot of them come with it in the in in the blood pressure uh, monitor. And also, it when you take for depending on which one you buy, it will highlight. You know, it will either be in orange, so green will be normal, and then it will be either in orange. But if you just take it as a ballpark of hundred to one hundred and thirty-five, top version, uh, top top reading, sixty-five to eighty-five bottom reading um, and it's not just a single reading obviously if you take your blood pressure when you've just exercised or you've cut if you're anxious and you're you know it, it will be high one reading we don't really uh, worry about you know it's if it's consistently high and actually it's really good to that's why it's good to have the machine and know what is normal um, for you um, if you're fit and well I would say that uh, uh, and you have, and we know that you don't have high blood pressure. I would say measuring it at least two or three times a year is is advisable. Once a month, if you want to. I mean, for women, for those of us that might perhaps take uh, the pill or contraception, we always have our blood pressure <laughs> checked anyway. It's a good uh, reason to have it done. But uh, yeah, that that's a ballpark uh, uh, reading. Now, of course, some of us have. Um, uh, instead of calling us, you can, uh, some of our surgeries have uh, bits where you can write to us, send us messages, you know, and we can just, you know, if you're not sure about something, you can just send a message. Most uh, GP surgeries now have Ask My GP or an e-consult where if you're not sure, uh, you can ask, you can speak to the nurse about it as well. You know, so many of the health professionals in the surgery, not just your GP can obviously speak to you about uh, blood pressure, but yes, Please, 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 if there's one thing you're going to do, get a blood pressure uh, reading, uh, a, a meter. Uh, if you buy more than one, get one for your family member as well. Uh, okay. Especially because it's very, very, it's so common in black. Yes, it's so common. So from 20, you should already be checking it all the time. Okay. Um, so some of these questions are, so there's a question here. I have type 2 diabetes. Do I still need an annual health check? Yes. So yes, because you have diabetes, you will have your annual diabetes check. So really, you, you, you won't really be doing an NHS health check because we're going to be seeing you every year anyway, sometimes every six months. Excellent. Um, there's a private message in and when I read it, you'll know it's private. It says, I've got a pot belly. Um, if you <laughs> I'm a man with a pot belly, um, how can you avoid it? it? Is it by eating once a day? Um, is there specific things you can do? I think part of it is with aging, your, where, where your fat deposits are, are different. Mm -hmm. So I think it's trying to avoid fat deposits, but exactly. any specific things you can do to avoid that dreaded pot belly? Alcohol. Alcohol. Beer. Beer. Um, it's called a beer belly, isn't it? Beer. Um, um, and if you can, so, so, that, so that little diagram I, I shared from Eat Well that has all the sort of sort of balanced diet things on there. If you're eating less red meat um, and sort of doing more, I know this is a, you know, people think it's a fad, but actually plant-based diets are, are quite healthy if you put in sort of uh, the lead, uh, proteins in it. Uh, mm. uh, so you want more unsaturated fats, as I was saying, rather than the saturated fats. So if you try and do that, um, you can sort of manage your pot belly. Obviously, if you lose weight, some of that will be, the fat will be coming off from your belly. Very, very important to um, really get rid of that because as I was saying, 
your pot belly means you have a bigger waistline. And we know that that's associated with um, increased risk of having diabetes. In fact, type two diabetes, one of the risks of that is having those kind of uh, pot belly. So exercise, exercise, you know, and also exercise. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you exercise it, we do know that exercise can reverse diabetes. Exercise is really the best thing that you can do. So exercise, so three things, exercise, avoid alcohol, especially beer and uh, try and eat as healthily as you can. Thank you. Um, someone shared the experience of using, trying to exercise consistently, and they shared that they use an app called Strava, and there are lots of other apps. And I think sometimes it, it helps with your kind of mindset. I know that the Fitbit helped my mum because seeing those numbers, she could, she'd ring me up and say, I've now got to X many thousand steps. I think it can be a positive reinforcement. Um, I have... Um, I have the Apple Watch with the rings and I'm obsessive about trying to close those rings. So um, what this uh, person James has asked is that, are, there, are you aware of any other options that people can um, do or have that can provide that positive reinforcement about getting some exercise in? And I think there are lots actually, James. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I've done, because I, I love watching TV, is that I try and use the treadmill by watching one of my favorite programs so that the time passes, because I find it really boring if I just have to run a treadmill. So I try and combine the two. So mm -hmm. you need to find your, your mm -hmm. own strategies, but there are lots of things by, yeah. and there are lots of things you can find online, really. Exactly. I mean, uh, uh, if you like dancing, lots of, lots of dancing exercises. Absolutely. Yeah, I love dancing. Zumba, Zumba Afrobeat things, um, you know, swimming. And join online sports. classes as well now. Yes, online classes. Uh, so many things on YouTube um, you can you can go on um, you might want to consider doing it um, as part of a group or, you know and actually when I was talking about the couch to 5k we um, in our association we kind of spurred each other on so someone will, work, will run 5k in 35 minutes another one will say I challenge you to doing it in 30 minutes and so those sort of things so you know finding motivation in in your in your tribe in your circle in your in your tribe in your in your circle so um but yes I I personally um I use the Apple watch my the, uh, the rings as my motivator and if it hasn't gone around I think oh god I need to walk around and, and walk you can obviously get a pedometer but having some kind of idea of um, how much exercise you've done in a day, how sedentary you, you, you've been, because as for those of us that sit on our desks all day, it's very easy, you know, sometimes I, I'll be at work and I've only done 2000 steps because I've been sat down on my, and I have to kind of try and make it up uh, when I get home. Yeah. Um, there's another quite specific question. I don't know whether you'd be able to answer this. It says here, how successful, and it's, it's a, uh, a specific company and I don't know whether you've heard of it I haven't it's called Saxander for weight management since it's been recommended by Mid Yorkshire Hospital Weight Management um, Unit so Saxander is that yeah. the injections I don't know what the S-A-X-E-N-D-E-R there are some um, injections that are, I mean, we as GPs can't pres prescribe it yet, but some pharmacists are, um, uh, uh, after an initial consultation with you, um, kind of uh, giving you these injections, uh, their way of uh, losing weight, I think Saxender. Actually, last week a patient was asking me about it, whether I could prescribe and and that's how I've, I've, I've heard of, of those. I think a few of, I have a few of my colleagues on the, on the chat, uh, there's a gastroenterologist on here, he might be able to put the answer on there for me. So if anybody knows about anything about Saxander, I haven't heard about it before. Yeah. Um, and you, you can provide a bit more information. And we've got, I know we've, we've got some um, medics because some they've been putting really helpful comments. Yes, some of my, yes, some of, some of my colleagues are on, yes. Um, E-consult, which yeah. I'm going to make, take a note of that. Uh, because, yeah, my yeah. GP's been a bit overrun. So thank you so much for your session. It's been fantastic. Um, we've got another couple of minutes. So I think what I'm just going to do is just summarise. I like to make sure that we have a take home message for the year. So I think new you, new year is, is great. Um, positive affirmations at the beginning of the year 
I think when you start a new month or a new year, there's just that sort of, I need to get up, get up and go really. It's, um, it's just a nice way of reaffirming and sort of um, looking inwards. Um, and I think the, the things that we have, have really heard about, we've heard about lots of interesting information, um, but the blood pressure machine is, is um, excellent. Please measure your blood pressure on a regular basis. Uh, and um, there's been another message about if you're already on blood pressure medication, is it necessary to measure your blood pressure? How often do you need to take the readings? Yes. So if you are on blood pressure medication, you'll find that at least once a year, we are checking your blood pressure when we're doing your medication review to know whether the medication is working. Personally, I tell my patients to uh, check their blood pressure at least once a month, even, even when they're on medication when they feel on or when they're feeling unwell. So we might be feeling a bit dizzy or anything like that, because sometimes we can over medicate you and the blood pressure can be low. Uh, but yeah, it's always good to just uh, have an idea of what it is. So once a month. And then obviously when you do come in to see us, we're, we're also checking it as well. But yeah, I'd say once a month um, if you're on antihypertensives. So before I summarise, I've missed a couple of questions. So one of them is that, your, you, you know, your nice eat well guide, there wasn't a lot of reference to Caribbean African foods. Yes. Um, so a bit of a gap. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, uh, we did, <laughs> there wasn't. And actually, we did say that uh, probably, yes, I will next time, if I, if I, when I come back, I will, uh, I will try and address that. But yes, our... And we don't have a lot of that. I, I did. I was checking to see, but I, I think probably I would have put a bit more of, about our sort of diets on there. But uh, obviously, because we eat lots more oil, obviously, I should have made a mention about red oils, uh, our, our palm oil that we like a lot. Um, but in general, I think if we cook our food um, just in moderation in, in terms of looking at how much salt we're putting in. If we want to put out palm oil, obviously not putting too much, swapping the palm oil for um, uh, uh, vegetable oil um, uh, and, and all those sort of things and eating less portions. You know, most of our African or Caribbean diet, we, we like to eat, eat lots of uh, meal, uh, the, the, the corn meal, cassava meals and uh, and just, you know, halving your portions and, and, and doing things like that, because uh, uh, having more of the veg uh, uh, than the meal. And, and actually, there are different uh, kinds of meals that are not uh, carbohydrate based that you can be that you can use to replace it. But yes, uh, uh, point taking for the next time. And then... Um... I think we're going to have to have another session on, on this that somebody called Tony has, has raised about health anxiety and doubts of GP. Because I think we can, we've had a number of sessions with um, psychiatrists who've helped us to sort of tap into and, and look at some of the issues with anxiety in, in health. Um, so the question here was about when you're having doubts about your health and you've been to your GP and your doctors and they're saying everything's fine. And you're not sure it's true. So we've had um, also specialists here who've talked about conditions that are really difficult to diagnose. And for people who are going back to their GPs with um, symptoms that seem to be unresolved, what to mm -hmm. do as well. Mm -hmm. So thanks for raising that, Tony. And I think we're going to have another session about anxiety and what to do with things that are difficult to, to um, diagnose. And, and Nikki, thanks for your comment because Nikki's saying that they've, they've been to the GP, they've been trying to get through to the GP um, and have waited sometimes for over an hour on the phone. So your GP sounds great, Linda, but honestly, from personal experience, I know that there are GPs out there that are really difficult to get Yes, yes. and as I said, it's, it's more of the fact that um, there's shortages and, and we have more increased uh, demand but um, increasingly, as I said, there's e-consult, ask my GP, there's other ways of, of, um, of getting through. Uh, in, 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 in response, if I can just go back to, to some of the symptoms, we do have condi a condition called um, cinnamon of things called medically unexplained symptoms. Um, um, what I would just highlight is that if you've been to see us, um, you've seen one GP, we said we've done all the tests, we can't find anything and you still feel that you're something's 
not right, then you can, you know, you, you can always um, see another GP in the practice. I think me and most of my colleagues uh, sort of uh, are very happy to uh, get another colleague to talk or even uh, sometimes refer onwards to secondary care where we think, gosh, we can't really explain what's going on. Obviously, health anxieties is a very, very common thing that we, we face in that, you know, that I see in a lot of my patients and actually um, sort of trying to address that. But obviously, we're quite um, keen not to just dismiss every everything that do, that we don't immediately find an answer for as a health anxiety. So, um, yeah, but, uh, you know, please always come and talk to us. Uh, a lot of the times we're not aware that our patients are frustrated about what's going on. Sometimes you have a, a patient that has left another surgery and come to us and said, oh, my, my GP did not listen to me. But you read the notes and you see that actually a GP has done a, a few things, but sometimes it's been bit of breakdown in the com in the communication so please 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 just let us know you know if you're not happy or if you've got concerns most of you know our job is to try and help you so okay and uh, Theodore thank you so much for putting in some information about the succenda okay. yeah that's the thing that you want but I think the take-home message for those of you on YouTube and uh, Facebook that can't see Saxenda is has been used in weight loss, but what he's put, which is really, really important, is that it's in conjunction with diet and exercise. So I don't think Saxenda is the uh, the um, magic bullet that can make you, you know, slim without doing some of the work yourself, really. OK, so I'll go back to. Um, oh, um, someone's asked quickly, can you see your GP if they are they're outside you, the boundary of where you live? Can you have a different GP? So if you live in, you know, in a particular postcode area, can you go somewhere else? It, it, yes, in theory, but it really just depends on the particular surgery. So if you are elderly and you're someone that would not be able to get to the surgery, even if that GP takes patients out of the catchment area, um, we will have to decline because if, if we needed to visit you, it would be too far for us to be visiting. Imagine if you know, you're one hour away from us, it will just not be feasible. Um, but um, but in, in general, and in a lot of surgeries, especially the ones in London, you know, they have an, a policy of, you know, you can be seen um, if, even if you're outside the catchment, but usually you will just have to sign to say, if I'm unwell and I need you to come and see me, you, I will, you know, we will not be able to come and visit you, you know, how many ever miles away from us that you are. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, I'd like to say that a, a lot of us are, try our best to, to, to give the best care to our patients. But, you know, if you're with a surgery and you're not, um, you know, you know, you're not getting on, we don't all get on, you can always change surgeries. And I guess that's what your question, probably the question is alluding to that you might want to uh, change your, your surgery. You can do that. There's lots of options these days. I, I'm not specifically recommending online ones, but there are some um, online options as well for those people that don't really need to, to, to come in a, a, a few on there. So there's a lot more option in, you know, especially since the pandemic that, that, than we used to have before. Um, so please do look into that. And um, if you have any questions um, that you would like to ask me specifically um, uh, for those on the call, um, I'd be happy to sort of answer those. And um, if they're forwarded to me, I'll leave my details. Thank you so much. So I think we've come to the end of the session uh, and it's positive mindset, get a blood pressure machine and get your health check. So thank you so much, Linda. I'm sure we'll see you again um, because that was an excellent session. Um, we would like your slides really because we have lots of people who listen in that refer to them later on. And for those of you who are listening that want to access um, sessions that we've done before, access this session again, the link is here and you can find it on our YouTube channel. So thank you. I'm going to hand over to Charles. Thanks, Dr. Engelsey, you know, for hosting and also Dr. Linda for, you know, coming on the call. And like Dr. Engelsey said, we look forward to having you back as well as some of your colleagues. So massive thanks to everyone. You know, if you're joining for the first time, this happens every Saturday morning. 
you know, unless the Tengus is on holiday, then you you see <laughs> on the call. But we 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 you know definitely connecting and linking up with doctors up and down the country so that these sessions will continue. But also we have been fortunate, and we will be announcing hopefully by next weekend, you know, uh, some investment from the national lottery so that you know yes we come on Saturdays, but then what happens in between the sessions and how we you know share the resource you know, and, you know, from, from what our doctors present. So please, please, you know, if you want any further information or you need a second opinion, you know, most of the doctors who present here will offer free, you know, one-to-one -one consultation as providing you with second opinion or telling you exactly what you should ask your GP or what you should be asking, you know, the consultants you under. And, and they just do this to compliment. We also have our healthy hearts that run every Tuesday. So all our you know, presenters will talk about nutrition. And so this is about nutrition and physical activity every Tuesday evening between half past five and 7.30. So it's new year, join the challenge. You know, those on the close WhatsApp group, they always take photos of breakfast, lunch, supper, whatever you're eating. And, you know, it's holding each other to account. So by all means, drop us a line, you know, info at uk or health at and we'll share the, you know, WhatsApp link with you. And, you know, we're hoping to please spread the word, the same Zoom link every Saturday, you know, the same Zoom ID or join on YouTube and Facebook. So thanks for those who've joined us across multiple platforms. And this presentation is available on our YouTube channel. So go there. Have a look at it again and share the link with your colleagues. Many thanks, everyone. Look after yourself. If you haven't been jabbed, make sure you grab a jab. If you have any concerns about the vaccine, then our doctors are available. They'll give time, one-on-one -on -one conversation, objective, honest, you know, conversations. And, you, you, you know, you can't be guaranteed about that. And hopefully next week we might look into long COVID. And then the following week we have, you know, a dermatologist coming on. But we will have a plan, sort of a six-month plan, and we will share that with you. So if you are not on our mailing list, please join info, you know, at but UK, And, you know, we look forward to seeing you next Saturday. Oh, Tuesday for the Healthy Hearts. So have a wonderful weekend. Look after yourself and stay safe. Bye. Calm Health Hour. Giving back health advice. Get informed today to have a better, healthy tomorrow.